welcome to Coach TV. On this series, the best and brightest business, life, and executive coaches share their tactics for improved personal performance and in business, improved profitability and growth. Today, I'd like to introduce some of our best coaches. First of all, we have Lindsay Lawless, who is a money consciousness coach and accountant. And then we have Lisa McBride, who is a professional real estate pro, as well as a SCORE mentor. And finally, we have Archie Strimmel, who is a retired football coach and business executive. So welcome. Thanks, Thank Bruce. Thank Glad to have us. you. Lindsay, I'm going to start with you. I know you as a money consciousness coach, but I'm not quite sure what that is. Why don't you explain to us what that means? Sure. So um, I help clients to work through money trauma um, and to create sustainable wealth. They're creating a roadmap for themselves and a plan of how to get there. So a big part of this process is not only the kind of tactical masculine side of how much money you're bringing in and what you're spending, but it's also more of the feminine principles of the mindset and the relationships around money and the experiences that you hold throughout your life from how your parents interacted with money to maybe the relationship you have around money with your spouse and all these kind of environmental stimuli that start to guide and shape how we behave with money. How did you develop this concept? Sure. So, um, you know, I worked in corporate accounting for years and was doing a lot of work for high net worth individuals, companies, C-Corps, S-Corps. And I also kind of branched into the boutique accounting space where I was servicing high-end entertainers. And there was a lot of kind of doing the work for them. And I was seeing kind of the mindset um, lack that was there and like the, the shift that was necessary for them to really understand what they were spending, what they were bringing in, and really how to manage their finances. So um, when I started my own business, I was really interested in kind of stepping into a new space to help empower and educate people to manage their finances, mm -hmm. to manage their finances for themselves and their business for their family. Um, and through this process, I really started to notice the need for just the, the mindset work and the emotional and spiritual work that's necessary um, more than just the strategies to be employed. Because we can teach you how to acquire money, but if you don't actually break down some of those blocks that are hindering you and getting in your way, then it's hard to make that sustainable. Who is this program designed for? Sure. So it's designed predominantly for women. Um, myself, being a woman entrepreneur, it's something that's very near and dear to my heart. Um, and I also was raised by a single mother who didn't necessarily have the skills that she needed to be able to make the most out of her finances. So through you know, my life experience, as well as watching women around me not necessarily have the skills that they need to really mm -hmm. own that in the way that would empower them and really allow them to be the, the boss woman of their life, right. um, was kind of hindered in that way because whether it was an environmental factor or something in their lifestyle or something that was behavioral or intrinsic, they just didn't feel confident around money. So that's something that I really wanted to change. When people work with you, what kind of shifts do they experience? Sure. So lots of shifts. Um, the shifts are going to be, sometimes you can see these shifts right away, and it's going to be stuff like the perspective that you have around money, how comfortable you are talking about money, um, the ability to look at a budget without, you know, feeling immediate anxiety or kind of this avoidance that a lot of people have around money. Okay. So that's one shift that comes into play. And then, of course, the more tangible creation of wealth and the pay down of debt and the ability to really feel like you're on top of your finances and that you know that you're creating a roadmap to generating wealth, to being able to leave a legacy. Let's talk about wealth for a minute. Sure. Wealth means different things for different people. If you're an extremely wealthy person, you might be having anxiety about losing your wealth. Sure. Okay. If you're a person that doesn't have anything, wealth means something that may be even unattainable. And there's everything in between. Sure. How do you define wealth for, your, for your clients? Certainly. So that's a, um, an awesome part of kind of the inventory process. So when I work with my clients, we do an inventory of kind of what is their value system. Because you need to know what your values are to start to be able to align your spending habits with those values. And then the next steps are the mindset shift that's necessary. So when we're going through this process and you're doing this inventory, you're really defining what wealth means to you. So if what wealth means to you is that you need to make a set amount of money and there has to be this much money in the bank for you to not have anxiety and fear that something's going to happen, then we would create an emergency fund. And you would put aside three months' worth of expenses, which we over time would be building up. Okay. And that could be one way that you could kind of alleviate that for what wealth means to you. At the same time, um, maybe wealth means having more time off. Maybe wealth means spending more vacations with your family. 
So in that sense, if you're an entrepreneur, that might require a different approach. You might need certain systems and processes in your business to help kind of free flow things to allow you to be step outside of that. At the same time, it might mean, again, having a vacation fund. It might mean having a dream fund, which makes things fun and exciting. So rather than it just being like the point of this is to make more than you spend and to pay down all your bills, it's also about creating something sustainable for yourself. It's about creating a lifestyle that you want to lead and then allowing money to empower you to do that. Okay. So what are the top three tactics that you recommend to the people that you work with? Sure. So the first tactic is pay yourself first. This is yeah. crucial. So often people pay all their bills every month and they're kind of scrambling. And if they're lucky, there's like a few pennies to rub together at the end for themselves. If that. If that. Um, <laughs> I think it's something crazy like 80% of Americans have less than $1,000 in their bank account at any given time. So, I mean, that just gives you an example of kind of the style that we kind of go through life in a much more airy fashion with kind of less, than, less of a plan. Um, but at the same time, it's really important to be able to pay yourself first, do the things that you need to do for yourself, and then process your bills. Because then you're going to feel strong and confident about what you're doing with your finances rather than feeling bogged down by them, overwhelmed by them, kind of like it's chaotic and there's not a solution for it. So paying yourself first is crucial to do this. And I know um, there's kind of different ways to do this. So for example, putting that money aside into a savings account right away before any bill payments are processed, before you buy groceries or do anything throughout the month is one way that you can pay yourself first. Okay. How do you charge? So I charge, typically I work with clients on a minimum of a three-month basis because it really does take about three months to, like I mentioned, really see the changes. Sure. Um, so, and I work with clients on a flat fee. And then I'm also, as I mentioned to you before, in the process of writing a book. Because a question I get all the time is, how is the people that need money help with money the most, aren't, that, aren't those the people that don't have money to afford your services? Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a twofold. So, but a solution that I pr proposed to that was creating this book. Because I do want it to be accessible. Mm -hmm. I do want it to be something that's for everyone. It's not for you know, the top 1%. That's not why I'm doing what I'm doing. Sure. So that was really important to me, and it's going to be um, something that's very accessible to anyone that really gives them kind of an entry-level overview of how I work with clients so that they can kind of start on that process to maybe start to apply some of those tactics and strategies mm -hmm. to then be able to afford to work with me on a larger capacity if they're interested in really growing. So does the book have a title yet? It does. I actually, mm. I was in a three-day author symposium recently, mm. and I locked down the title and started to kind of set everything up for the publication process. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be Heal Money Trauma and Create Sustainable Wealth. Ooh, that's a good title. <laughs> Thank you. When is the book coming out? So um, it's looking like it's going to be out in April. I'm actually about 80% done with that now. However, okay. um, I'm waiting because I want to have a section of the book where it's women telling their stories around money and talking about their experiences with money, kind of providing their transformation stories from all different perspectives, whether it's they had a lot of money and they lost it, or they never have money and they acquired wealth later, really kind of talking about all different kind of environments. And um, so with that in mind, I'm waiting to get some of those back and kind of go through the editing and reviewing process of those, and then I'll be able to move forward. How do people find you? People find me from lawlessbalance.com, as okay. well as Lindsay Lawless on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, any social media platform. Okay. Thanks so much for being on the show. It's very interesting what you do. Thank you. Yep. Lisa. Hi, Bruce. Hi. So you are somebody who has coached 160 real estate agents. I know you as a SCORE mentor. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know that with all of the things that you're doing, there must be ways that you transfer what you've done in the real estate industry and in coaching there to the clients that you work with in SCORE. So before we do that, what is, what, tell me a little bit about SCORE. I know about it, but for the audience. Um, sure. Well, SCORE is a nonprofit organization of um, business professionals that volunteer their time. Some of them are retired, some of them are not. Right. Um, and we help businesses either begin their business or even in business clients expand their business or if they have questions of uh, just different things, whether it's marketing, finance, we're here to mentor them and help them succeed. Okay, so how do you transfer the wisdom that you've learned as a very successful real estate professional, how do you transfer that wisdom over to any wide variety of businesses that you work with through SCORE? Well, um, as a business professional, first of all, I think a lot of businesses are run similarly, and we have to have uh, certain things that we do in every business. So it's, okay. it's pretty easy to transfer that into a lot of these businesses that I work with. Um, you know, finding out what your goal is 
and for most of these businesses that I work with, it's finding out what their big goal is and what their vision is for their company right. and um, finding the path to keep them on that. And I always tell them they need to start with the end in mind and then we'll work backwards is how to achieve it. Is mentoring fun for you? Oh, yes. Tell us a little bit about, give us an example of one of the clients that you've worked with where it's been really fun for you. Um, well, recently I've had someone that, um, she's an in-business client. She has a good clientele of business, but she really is not um, savvy with the financial part of it. She doesn't know if she's making money, not making money. She, like, just, she doesn't know how much it costs her to run her business. So it's been kind of interesting for me because normally what we see is a lot of people are like, how do I acquire business? Where, where's my business coming from? How do I get it? She has business, but she doesn't have any idea if she's making money or not. And so we um, kind of started with like, well, what does it cost to run your business? Um, how much do you need to make? What is your goal at the end of the year to make? And just asking some, some basic financial questions. And I was a little surprised that she didn't know the answers to mm -hmm. these. And that's okay because, you know, we all don't know what we don't know. Right. And, um, but when we started talking through it, she's like, I had no idea what I need every month. And I said, well, then if you know what you need at the end of a month, let's break it down to what you need a week and then per day to sustain your business to help you grow it. On a recent episode, we had uh, Andrea Nirenberg on our show, who is known as the networking guru. Mm -hmm. And... I think that in your business, you must have built an incredible network. How did you do that, and how do you transfer that skill over to the people that you mentor? Um, well, the first step thing is that it takes time. It's not something that happens immediately, mm -hmm. and you have to be very diligent at it. It's a constant process. Um, I kind of knew that going into business that I wanted to be surrounded by excellence, I guess. And so I try to always find the people that are way smarter than I am in any room and learn from them because right. success leaves clues. And so, um, and I'm an avid student and I'm always trying to find out more about right. not just my industry, but all industries and how people have succeeded. Um, and so I feel like I've learned a lot from the people that I've surrounded. And then also I'm finding out what is pa their passion is. And when I can tap into that, um, they, you know, you build a rapport and a trust. So that's a little bit of like building the networks. Um, and I try to teach that with the mentoring clients is that first of all, to be patient because most of us want it immediately and it takes time, sure. um, to invest in other people, to learn from those around you, ask a lot of questions and, um, just be, be diligent in what you're doing. You come from an industry that is highly competitive. How do you separate yourself from your competition, and how do you now like, give that to your clients? How do you teach them? Well, first of all, I think you need to be very authentic to yourself right. because there's a ton of wonderful salespeople out there, and everyone's doing it a little bit differently, and there's a lot of ways to do business and get to the same result. Mm -hmm. And so, but I can't do it the way somebody else that might be highly successful do it. I have to... I have to do it my way. Right. And the only way I know how to do it is just be me and be authentic because people can sense when you're not and they want to work with someone that they trust and like and is genuine and has their best interest at heart. And so I, I just think that we have to become very, we need to be, very, it's very personal to, for me, in my business, right. selling a home, buying a home is very personal, it's very emotional. And as I transfer that into the coaching clients, Whatever they need to do, they have to have the passion for it. So I know that you also, you told me that you were coaching over 160 agents. <laughs> and first of all, that's like herding cats. I don't know how you do that. Uh, how do you do that? Um, well, well, first of all, I always tell people, I it didn't start with 160 agents. Um, I was offered a great opportunity to run a Keller Williams office, right. and there were 78 agents when I started. My job was to grow it and develop it. And um, so I had a vision of taking this company and making it number one in our marketplace, having the largest market share, and really having very educated agents. So when I started, it was to get to know the agents that were there. Right. and and dive into them because, again, we're going to succeed through other people. Sure. No one succeeds alone. 
So really getting to know what their goals were and helping them achieve them. And then as I recruited people, finding out what their, again, what their goal is, what somebody's goal might be to make a million dollars and somebody's goal might be to make enough to put their kids through college. And it, that's fine, but I have to talk to them at their level and make sure that I'm helping them succeed and then they'll help me succeed. It sounds like you as a SCORE mentor, you must be very, very effective at what you do. <laughs> and uh, that's not an easy job. I really appreciate what you're doing. What's the most fun that you have doing that? Oh, you know, I, I, I guess I just love talking to people mm -hmm. and um, it gives me a great sense of um, value, I guess, to help mm -hmm. somebody else. And so when I see things clicking with them um, and see that they're making strides and if they have a business plan and they come to me with their business plan and they're like, they checked this off, or I did what you said. And it's like watching them grow is mm -hmm. just fantastic. How do people reach you? Um, they can simply email me at Lisa McBride at kw.com or they can find me on Facebook at Lisa McBride Realtor. I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. Great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. Archie, you have an amazing background. Why don't you just briefly tell us a little bit about that and then ask some questions for you. Bruce, the first 10 years of my uh, working professional life was as a college football coach. Worked at four universities, had good success was blessed to be mentored by some of the best in the business. Unique personalities. Uh, two that were the old-fashioned Woody Hayes, uh, blood and guts and, and four yards in a cloud of dust type mentality. Uh, one guy, Jim Dennison, who was a Norman Vincent Peale disciple. And John Makovic, who dressed in Armani suits, drank uh, uh, fluid or, or drank wine, was a wine connoisseur, uh, and, and just really intelligent people. Uh, that helped kind of guide me along my way as I grew in, in business uh, on how I might conduct myself. I bet it's been a real fun ride for you. How similar is coaching football to running a business? get that question all the time, and it really is relatively a simple transference. Uh, you know, in the coaching business, uh, you, you're, you're measured on wins and losses. On, in the business cycle, you're measured in profits and losses, okay? Uh, you, in the, in the coaching business, you surround yourself with young people. You have an offensive coordinator, a defensive coordinator, kicking game coordinator, a special teams coordinator, a recruiting coordinator, a trainer, a manager. And in the business life, you have uh, sales uh, uh, vice presidents, you have operating vice presidents, you have maintenance people. So the, it kind of falls in a sequence how one supports the other uh, to build the profession. Okay, so tell me a little bit about motivation. When you're motivating a football player versus motivating somebody that reported to you in business, what's the difference and how did you do it? First of all, the, the young folks that I coached are very impressionable. And mm -hmm. uh, you had to make sure you took your time to communicate to them and really drive home the point of what you're trying to do with them, how you're trying to help them grow, not just as an athlete or a football player, but as a human being. Uh, and and when, you, when you got involved or when I got involved with the business profession, you already had people who were pretty much set in their ways, had one way to do things and that was the only way. So it was a little bit more difficult of a challenge because you had to change thought processes and uh, make people believe they could have successes. And, and uh, so similarities, but yet pretty distinct differences. What was the hardest experience you had motivating football players? Well, I, I, and I, I, uh, you, you mentioned players. Uh, when we first got to Wake Forest, my last coaching job, we inherited the worst program in, Ameri in Northern Hemisphere. Uh, five consecutive one in 10 seasons. Uh, we were a brand new staff, relatively young. All of us had come from very successful programs. We never experienced a losing season. So as we huddled and put together our strategies and game plans, uh, we focused on what we thought we could do. And lo and behold, our opening game against North Carolina State in Winston-Salem at our home stadium, uh, we pitched a shutout, beat them 14 to nothing. As a young 28-year-old defensive coordinator, I'm figuring this is pretty easy, okay? Uh, boy, was I in for a rude awakening. We then dropped 10 consecutive games. Oh. But they weren't, 
you know, we lost to LSU, uh, uh, one of the all perennial top 10 teams right. in Baton Rouge, 17, 14 on the last second field goal. We, we played good, but not good enough to win. Mm -hmm. So we worked like heck to build the strength, build the, the skill set, if you will, of our players. Right. But at the same time, uh, we also built what we call the golden ladder of success. We actually brought in a, a step ladder with 20 rungs. We painted it solid gold, okay, so it looked like it was a piece of gold. And with our players, and only our players, no one else was allowed to participate, we, we went rung by rung by rung, uh, with this first one being able to practice hard to the, the final was to win a national title. And in between was everything that it took to get from point one to point 20. And I'll tell you, our, our players started to believe uh, when we brought that in and we started developing that with them. Uh, and as this first year went on with the Golden Ladder of Success, we opened it up against Georgia, preseason number one team in America in Athens, Georgia. Mm -hmm. An enviable task for somebody coming off of 6-1 and 10s. Bottom line is we ended up beating them pretty soundly in Athens. Went on to go 8-3, and uh, finishing the top 10 in the country. Got the first bowl game in the history of Wake Forest. And it, what it did for not just the players but for the coaches you really then believe that golden ladder of success that you can accomplish goals as long as they're they're attainable and you set goals that are real. That's a great prop. I can picture that in my mind exactly what that looks like. Tell us more about that. Well, uh, the the thing that was really unique, the media got wind of this that we had done this, and they wanted to come in and actually video us meeting with our players. Uh, -uh. that was exclusively for our players and our staff and. Okay. They took such a, a uh, personal pride in that ladder and what they were accomplishing on a week-by-week -week basis. Right. Uh, we never quite, got, never quite got to the top rung, but I'll tell you, at one time we were ranked sixth in the country, uh, which, is, which had never happened. That's in pretty high up on the ladder. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so we were able to, to achieve a lot of those goals and objectives we set. Okay. Hey, Archie, thank you very much for being on the show. My pleasure. It's been really interesting listening to you. I want to turn this to all of you. I'm going to ask you one question. Each of you tell us, what are the top three tactics that you teach your clients? Let's start with you. Sure. So the first would be to pay yourself first. And what that really means is that before you process bill payments, before you buy groceries and cover your rent, you set money aside that's either going to go into a savings account or an investment account, whatever you've decided makes sense for you, and that you're going to pay yourself first. And then you're going to pay all your bills and kind of function from this zero budget place, meaning that then you go down to where there's zero dollars left. Okay. But that's okay because you paid yourself first. Okay. And then the second thing would be um, journaling. And I know that that probably sounds a little crazy, like why would I journal and how is that going to help me with my money? Um, but really what this does is the first few times you do it, it's going to be more of a brain dump. So you're going to do this and you're going to start to notice patterns <coughs> about how you communicate and to yourself and what that dialogue looks like and kind of those ideas and beliefs around money. That, this allows you to start to dissect those, to start to determine what you want to pull out and what mindset shift that you need to employ to start to think differently around money. Okay. And what's the third? And the third would be um, to have crucial conversations around money. And what this means is talking about your finances, talking to your partner, talking to your parents, talking to your children about money. It's so important because not only is this going to help create space for you to feel like you're not alone, mm -hmm. for you to feel confident about speaking around these issues, but you're going to create space for others to invite them into the conversation as well. Okay. Great. Thank you. Lisa, what about you? Top three. Um, well, start with the end in mind and have a big vision. And, okay. so, and know what your vision is. Uh, I write it down, become accountable to it. So knowing that. Um, the second is learning how to work your finances and knowing where your money is going and how much it costs to run your business. Okay. And uh, the third one is knowing your big why. Why are you doing this? Because um, when you're an entrepreneur, self-employed, you're not just doing that thing. You're doing the accounting and the marketing and the IT work. And you need to have a passion for what you're doing because there's a lot of hours getting started. And it's not just doing one thing. Knowing the why is a great question. It really is. And maybe that should be the first. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Archie, what about you? Top three. Keep in mind, Bruce, all of these businesses are people-oriented businesses. And so I have a tendency to lean towards uh, suggestions for people. Right. Uh, first one is develop a phenomenal work ethic. 
You can't work hard enough to, to achieve success. Number two, make sure you're viewed as someone who is honest and has integrity and, and you can count dealing with them that they're going to do what they say you're going to do. Right. And, and, and number three, treat people like uh, you'd like to be treated. All great. All of you were really terrific. Thank you very much. Archie, how did they reach you? Uh, Archie.stremmel at outlook.com. Okay. Any final thoughts? That's it. Okay. Thanks for having us. Yeah. Been, thank you so been much. grand. Loved having you. You're great coaches. Hopefully, we'll have you back on set very soon. Thanks, Bruce. This has been Bruce Stout for Coach TV. Please join us again for our next episode.